Everybody, uh, good afternoon. I am so uh, glad to welcome you here this afternoon, especially for this event, uh, Exploring Creativity with Rita Blit. Um, I've known Rita for a number of years, so I'm particularly um, excited for the opportunity to see her art and learn about her creative process. So we are all in for a huge uh, treat uh, this afternoon. This event is part of the Exploring Creativity series of Ashby Village. And for those of you who don't know, or those who do, Ashby Village is an organization in the East Bay of older adults living at home and supporting each other to live fully uh, in community. Um, and we produce very high quality programs such as the one today people also through the village access services that um, help people stay safe and independent at home as we age in the East Bay. Um, we invite you, um, Jessica mentioned that the next Living Room Chat is on March 14th. I encourage you to come check it out, learn about how to become a member or a volunteer. And I also, um, we, we're uh, thrilled to be able to provide these quality programs free of charge, but I also invite you to consider being a supporter of Ashby Village 
and um, as generously as you can uh, to enable us to keep doing things like this and to keep growing and thriving um, in the East Bay. So uh, there'll be a link for that in the chat as well. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Pat Sakai, who is a founding member uh, and leader of Ashby Village, a former board member and an active member of the Exploring Creativity Committee. And um, here's Pat. Thanks so much, Avi. Welcome everybody to this program today. I just want to say that I feel so honored that Rita Blit asked me to work with her on this event. It has been a real pleasure getting to know this truly remarkable woman and to become familiar with her incredible body of work. Um, I've come to the conclusion, and I think you will, if you haven't, don't already know Rita, that we have in Rita Blit a real treasure amidst this community we call Ashby Village. Uh, so how can I describe her in, quickly? We have in Rita Blit a multidimensional visual artist, uh, a painter who has created monumental sculptures up, up to 60 feet tall. And she's also a created, uh, directed films inspired by her work. Rita often integrates the work of other uh, art forms and collaborates from artists from multiple disciplines. Um, her work is exhibited in numerous museums across the US as well as in multiple international locations. Um, Rita's film Caught in Paint was shown in over 130 film festivals, winning many awards. And her most recent film, I think she did this in 2020, uh, The Sun Still Shines, led to the Raleigh Film Festival naming Rita as Visual Artist of the Year. So that's a real honor. Today you're in for a very special treat, and more so because Rita's work and the processes that she uses uh, to create this work are so well documented in films she's made over the years. And today we're gonna have an opportunity to watch a number of film clips and a few short films uh, in between conversations with her. Hopefully some of you were able to catch the short film uh, Caught in Nature uh, before the be formal beginning of this program. So I want to formally welcome Rita Blit. Say hello, Rita. We can Hi, see thank you, Pat. It's a treat being here. I, I guess nobody enjoyed the film as much as I did. <laughs> I had to laugh. I, I truly enjoy my work. That's great. That's wonderful. And well, there's yeah, there's there's so much we could discuss today, but let's first talk about a fantastic thing that happened more recently to Rita. Um, Rita, you and I talked a few months ago about how critical it was for you to find a home where your works, as you said, can live together and be shared with the world. So can you share this wonderful story just to start us out today? I would love to share that story. But first, I just feel compelled to mention that uh, with all my joy and with all our joy in life here, um, I, my heart goes out to the people of Ukraine. And I just have to recognize that pain and wish them well at this time. And then I'll tell you my excitement about um, having my legacy collection at the Mulvey Museum. Washburn University in Topeka, Kansas. Um, when I got a call from the vice president asking me to, uh, uh, if I would donate my collection to the gallery connected to their performing arts center, I was absolutely overjoyed. My work is music, dance, and there's no better place for it than connected to the performing arts center. So I'm quite thrilled. That's such an honor. So we want to show uh, the first film, formal film of this event. It's about nine minutes and it's called Around and Round, a painting, an exhibition and a book. And it focuses on some of Rita's most important work in the collection that she donated to the Mulvane Museum. And it's described by its curator and director, Connie Gibbons. Uh, Connie gives, I think, a good overview of Rita's work as a painter 
And right at the beginning of this film, you're going to see some of Rita's sculpture uh, in the garden there. So let's watch the first video. Around and Round features a little over 40 artworks that span a 70-year time frame of Rita Blitz creative output. I wanted to talk about this particular painting, which is the, uh, the title of the exhibit, Around and Round, because I think it exemplifies in so many ways the way Rita has worked through her life. Rita's earliest years as a painter, she was inspired by nature. She painted a lot of works of her family. Her work has changed so much over that 70 year period, but she constantly and consistently comes back to the same themes, the same kinds of marks and considerations that she's making on the surface of her works. In 1996, following the birth of her granddaughter, Doriana, um, she, was, she was so full of just excitement and joy over the birth of that child. And she began doing these huge canvases. Some of them were 12 feet wide, drawing with two hands, using paint brushes in both her hands and coming up and making these incredible circular forms that you'll see in her work throughout her life. She would go through periods of time where she was just using the black on white and by the time she gets to the mid-90s, she recognized that she wanted to bring color back into her paintings. You'll see it in Celebrating Doriana and some of the Aspen paintings that she was doing at that time. What Around and Round expresses for me as I look at it is this incredible discipline to put down this blue, see these colors start to run and walk away from it and know that it's complete. And I think you'll see that discipline in so many of the works that she's done throughout her life. I see Around and Round as an iteration of Rita's tendency as an artist to return again and again to the theme of the oval in her work, those circular forms that have a real womb-like feeling to them. And again, the use of these really bold lines and the introduction of color. In many ways, even though you might not think that looking at this particular painting, I think Rita Blit is a colorist. She understands color and how color vibrates and changes the tone and the sense and how you might respond to a particular work of art.
We've stepped back in time. These are some of the earliest works in the exhibition. Red Barn was done in 1958. Exodus was done in 1960. Rita's really painting more like an impressionist. She felt like she had to paint something that was recognizable, even though the surface treatment is really very loose and very expressionistic. And you can really see her use of color in here that I think is so splendid with these really bold reds and blues and yellows and how vibrant they are and how well they connect everything across the surface. And the same thing with the red barn, how she's used color a little more subtly, but just as effectively. I thought it was important to point out on these works just how, how she uses line to divide the surface of her canvas and what a strong element it is with the line of the fence. That use of her line, I think, really is a precursor to the kind of line that we see in her later years. Although the lines that she started using later were much more fluid. I wanted to finish with this work. Dancing with the Universe was done in 2018, very recent. I think it really helps to bring us back to where we started with the around and round and Rita's use of those black bold strokes on white surface. One thing I think is so splendid about Rita's work is just the confidence. When she approaches a blank piece of paper, she can immediately articulate very quickly and without mistakes, the dancer moving through space or the music that she's hearing. or her feelings for her family, or just her spirit. We started with a round and round, but we come back to the same place where we started, and that's Rita Blitz's work. That's what she's done for 70 years, around and round. She comes back again and again. Jessica, do you want to continue that film? Okay, well, I think I'm going to proceed. Um, we wanted to show the credits for that film and it was produced by the Mulvane Museum. And uh, so as Connie Gibbons says, it's been actually over 80 years now that Rita Blitt has been working as an artist and I thought it would be good to go back now to the beginning and talk about your early years as an artist, Rita. 
let's start out with a question about what was your what are your most memorable childhood experiences and memories creating art? I think the earliest memory is that of my grandfather sending little black line drawings at the bottom of his letters from New York. He it designed embroidery. And when he sent those little drawings to us, then I echoed those drawings back to him. And I have a feeling that today I'm still echoing his drawings with my black lines. <laughs> and then I see little Rita dancing, tap dancing and drawing all over the house, <laughs> particularly the frosted windows, that was wonderful. But on every little white piece of segment of paper I could find, I took advantage of the space to draw. So I think I was drawing, echoing his lines most all my life. And then when I went to school, one important memory was my fifth grade teacher who uh, thrilled me with the magic word, create. That word still vibrates within my body when I hear it. How special and how special she was. Um, then in fifth grade also, I won a scholarship to the Kansas City Art Institute for children's classes. And that thrilled me so that I said, maybe someday I could become an artist. <laughs> and become an artist you did. Um, we want to start now, and I'm sure Rita has so many stories that she told me over about a five month period and we can't include them all today, but um, I want to show uh, a short clip from a film uh, called Dancing Hands, and this was made in 1984. And Rita talks about her work as a painter, which she started as, transition into creating sculpture. So next video, this is about two and a half minutes. I was painting murals for a shopping center in St. Joseph, Missouri, when the architect asked me to create sculpture around a post in the mall. First I said, no, I'm not a sculptor. I was very excited about my painting and I knew that I was growing as a painter. And I was really afraid to take time away from that. And then I realized that I was really just dying to get involved in sculpture. I started experimenting with every material conceivable that I could manipulate with my own hands. Seeing my forms move in space was so exciting that I could not go back to painting on a flat surface. So I decided to combine painting and sculpture into one art form. I worked on my canvases in space, I kept thinking of dancers moving in space, relating to each other. I started feeling like I needed to find a new material for my sculpture, a material that really felt like it belonged hanging in space. And that's when I found plexiglass. It's, it was such a beautiful material. The light and shadow really inspired me, but plexiglass was full of new problems. It scratched as I worked with it. I got burned as I worked with it. It cut me. But it was an exciting material that seemed to be the answer for what I was searching for. For the first time, I found myself making art not related to real objects, just making shapes that felt right.
Oh, say, Pat, you're muted. What, dear? Say, tell Pat she's muted. Oh, Pat, I think you're muted, Pat. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't tell you sooner. <laughs> Sorry. Um, can you, following up on that, let's talk about uh, the story about your exciting 1969 New York plexiglass exhibition. Can you share that? Um, I had a New, a New York show scheduled for the plexiglass exhibition. And um, the right before the exhibit, uh, we were out to dinner and this man said, why don't you go on the Tonight Show and tell about your exhibit? <laughs> And I went to bed that night and woke up in the morning and thinking about my wonderful husband, how he was working so hard uh, packing my plexiglass sculpture and, and the wonderful things that were happening to me. And I started writing a book. Once I started writing, crazy, horrible, painful things started happening, which gave me lots of material for a book. And... Uh, a little hard to suffer through, however, but um, I spent a year after the exhibit writing that book. Uh, Life's not always chocolate, kind of chocolate in honor of my husband. <laughs> um, but something very wonderful did happen that I want to mention at the uh, opening of the exhibit. Um, an art critic came up to me and said, what are your thoughts about God? And I said, God? <laughs> I wanted to talk about my art. <laughs> anyway, uh, I asked his wife, why did he ask me that question? And she said, he must have seen something in your work. Well, that question was the very beginning of my spiritual search, which was enhanced two years later by a miraculous event related to a found object sculpture. Uh, but through the years, I read and I wondered. And uh, at the same time, I don't think I related it. But periodically, I'd stop and say, where did this art come from? How did I do this? Uh, but now today, I recognize that uh, as far as I could go in that search, which wasn't satisfied until the 90s, uh, I realized the connection to my art and to the spirit. And I'm grateful to that critic. He'll never know. <laughs> That's a wonderful story. Um, you want to say anything more uh, about that exhibit? Um, the only thing I was going to say at one moment was to describe the thrill I had when I opened the door to the New York show and saw that my uh, suspended images were reflecting light and moving in response to our bodies. My daughter, Taylor, then called Connie, uh, was there and Erwin, my husband. And it was quite thrilling, quite a thrilling moment. That's These that's things good. remain in my head. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. So you said earlier, Rita, that you spent the next year after this exhibit writing your book. Mm -hmm. uh, but you eventually returned to making sculptures. And we want to show the next short uh, clip from the same film, Dancing Hands, which documents your continuation in sculpture. And I think you'll especially appreciate Rita's process and how she involved her family in her work. So next film clip. My first aqua blitz sculpture. The sheet of plexiglass was sawed to make these slits. And then the flat sheet was put in the 14 foot oven. When the plexiglass came out of the oven, it was hot and limp, and Erwin was assigned to one corner, Connie to another, the man who owned the oven was in another corner, and I had another corner, telling everybody to push here and pull there. Within seconds, the plexiglass cooled, 
and my sculpture was created. sculpture, 43 feet high, is composed of 9,000 feet of beaded chain and 250 plexiglass discs that were cooked in my oven at home. Poor Erwin and Connie came home to the smell of plexiglass instead of chocolate cakes. I love that. <laughs> um, can I, I just want to, before I ask my, uh, the next question about, I wanted to follow up with um, plexiglass and working with plexiglass. I wanted to ask the question about the convention for naming your various sculptures. Um, Rudy, can you talk about that? Um, well, I do remember I'm getting ready for this New York show and uh, Connie and Erwin and I were in the car coming home from a concert and uh, Erwin asked, what are you going to name your, your show? And he said, sculpture show, of course. <laughs> and he says, no, it has to stand out amongst the hundreds. Anyway, so we tossed around ideas, the, the three of us, and came up with Orb Blitz for my show. And then I called uh, one of my most important sculptures, Orblit, one, two, three, and so forth. And then there was a series intended to be by the water called Aqua Blitz. Oh, and Aqua Blitz. Well, you know, naming is always the last thing for me, but um, this was fun. I called uh, my sculptures inspired by water Aqua Blitz. The uh, humorous ones, Lunar Blit, <laughs> uh, the standing still sculptures, Stay Blit. <laughs> right. I think that was about it. Yeah. I Great. took a bit of that idea from uh, Alexander Calder, who I forgot what he named his stable, stables. Mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Great. So, uh, so you work with plexiglass a lot. So can you expand on why you like working with plexiglass for sculpture? Well, one thing I loved about it so much was when I pushed the sheet of material and, and, and pushing into the shape I wanted, and then I let my hands go and watched it take its own spot it dried into a very natural form. And I just love that. Of course, I love the light and shadow reflection. But I want to tell you about one sculpture, the Orblet sculpture, that um, I started with a two foot disc, round disc, and I heated it and pushed it in the center, uh, trying to make my shape I wanted. And I pushed so hard that my hand came through and it tore. And I don't know if I was upset for a second, but when I saw the beautiful tear, torn edge, I was very happy. And I took advantage of that accident to make perhaps at that time, and I still feel maybe it's my most important sculpture. 
And the reason why I feel it's so important not, um, is I had concluded in looking at it, that it was uh, felt like the contrast of pain and joy. At, some at one time I started calling it uh, joy slash pain. And then I went back to the word orblet because I like for people to see whatever they want in my work. That's great. That's wonderful. So there's one last clip from this film, Dancing Hands, uh, which shows more about your uh, transitions in your work related to drawing and your monumental sculptures which are installed in many countries around the world at this point. Um, so let's look at, uh, this is a seven minute clip from the film Dancing Hands. I remember through the years of working on sculpture and I would be struggling with the physical efforts of uh, uh, working with materials and involvement and, and uh, pain sometimes. And, and I'd stop and remember the sheer joy of painting. And, you know, I'd say, you know, what kind of nut am I to give up that joy of painting? But I never doubted that I was doing the right thing. It was just funny to, to realize the contrast between spontaneously and joyously putting paint down on canvas and struggling with the physical demands of being a sculptor. I wanted some drawings to go over our bed and I put my doodles on good drawing paper. It was a, an arabesque dancing line and I didn't have the maturity, the sophistication to just leave that line alone and let it just be a beautiful line. I probably I suppose was embarrassed to just put a beautiful line up on the wall. So in order to justify the existence of that, that line, I added a face and, and hands and shoes and even sequins to match the bedspread in the room. 23 years later, I made this sculpture from a spontaneous drawing. It was then I realized my doodles were the essence of me. So I started buying stacks of drawing pads and pouring out drawings page after page after page. danced from my hands, I believed that they were related to the trees that I drew as a child. I always drew trees, and I always felt each branch as it grew up from the roots. This was the first of my spontaneous drawings that I turned into sculpture. From 
this time, everything that I would create would come from the spontaneous drawing. This is Nessie, about which I also have written a children's book. I call this dancing. happened. But all of a sudden, I took up two Conte crayons and started drawing with both hands at once. to figure out why on earth I was drawing with both hands at once. I remembered how my work has been influenced by dance, and I realized that perhaps I'm dancing on paper. And how can you dance with one half of your body? I needed my entire body to dance, to feel whole. Well, I think you'll agree those are pretty remarkable structures, these sculptures. Um, Rita, can you share with me the most challenging part of your creative work during this period? You told me a really incredible story about uh, the installation of one piece in particular. You just saw that piece uh, in the film. Just, um, I, I had a drawing. Really, I think this is the exact size of the drawing. And the architect saw it. And this is where I first started making uh, monumental sculpture. The architect saw this and said, um, can you make that 26 feet tall? <laughs> and I said, sure. <laughs> but, but I had no idea how to do it. So I relied upon the telephone book a lot. <laughs> and I started calling to find out who uh, uh, manufactured uh, metal objects. And I found the uh, place that uh, made, made uh, parts, uh, metal parts and sent them all over the world. And the man in charge that I was talking to happened to have graduated from the Kansas City Art Institute. And he really understood me and, and what I needed. So that was wonderful. I had that in place. But then, uh, and I also I had a wonderful structure structural engineer friend uh, who I, I spoke to. But the important thing was that I had a pattern. So um, I had this little tiny drawing and I didn't know how to get it 26 feet tall. So I started calling around and I found Western Blueprint um, said should they would do it for me, blow it up 26 feet. 
But what I didn't dream is that when it came back to me, it was in 18 pieces. And I had to crawl around on my hands and uh, knees and, um, and put those pieces together. Luckily, when the my drawn line uh, blew up, when it was blown up into larger size, there were little dots. Then I found one dot that matched another dot, put a straight pin in it, grabbed the scotch tape, and moved on to another spot. Well, that taught me a lesson. And next time I had a, a drawing to be blown up, I uh, numbered, put numbers all over it. So I'd have an idea how to put it together. Then of course, today in the tech world, I don't have to do that. <laughs> What a change, what a change in the world. <laughs> um, oh, but then I think you wanted to tell me to tell the story about installing that sculpture. Yes. Right? Yes. Sent the seven pieces, seven parts to Rockaway, New Jersey uh, to be installed in the shopping center. And this is right before the opening. And um, the men put together, installed a 13 foot bottom. And then they got up on a scaffold up in the air. And after a while they hollered down and said, Rita, it doesn't fit. And I said, my fabricator in Kansas City said that it, it's idiot proof. And he said, next time bring the idiot. <laughs> So indeed, I guess it was this part that was missing. And it was uh, this part. And it was FedEx to Rockaway in time for the, put everything together for the opening. What a crazy story. It's more yep. than just creation of the actual piece. It's right. I'm sure the installation is as you, as it is intended to be. Wow. So I, I want to switch gears and kind of you've alluded to this several times about where does your artistic inspiration come from? <laughs> well, that's probably a complicated story, but yeah. Well, I had just referred to that thought from the man at the opening who inspired my spiritual search. Right. But also then I think what you're talking about too, which I, I, I must mention is that uh, I had such a loving, supportive husband and I really think that he inspired my work, number one. And, uh, uh, but then uh, we went to Aspen, Colorado in the summer and I was very inspired there. And I did some of my most important works there. I painted, I made films. Uh, most importantly, I sat in the concerts and drew to every beat of the music. Uh, either in the back row where I wouldn't disturb anybody or I went to rehearsals. Something else, Pat, that I don't, I don't know that I mentioned to you that was so important that happened in Aspen. One of the most important things that probably happened in my whole career is that someone stopped me and asked me to create something we can send all over the world to make the world a better place. And that's kind of overwhelming. And the thought of being able to do such a thing was overwhelming. And it, it was an honor that, that she felt I was capable. And then later I thought, well, is this a joke? <laughs> but it took me five years and I came up with the words, kindness is contagious, catch it. And this was in the early eighties. And at that time, to, to start talking publicly about the word kindness took a lot of guts. I was really kind of afraid people would laugh at me and think of me as a Pollyanna, um, but I was, I believed in it. And I, I, I repeated those words. There, there came a committee of women that uh, formed a kindness uh, organization, which is a big organization today. We sent, I sent, uh, I made a, a poster uh, and I sent it to 
every country where I knew people. I, I put 11 in a tube and uh, I didn't think about they couldn't read English. <laughs> Anyway, I send it all over the world. And I think ultimately um, millions of people were affected by my words. And I feel very grateful and very proud and happy that I had that opportunity. I don't know that I really made the world a better place. It needs a little help yet. <laughs> Rita, let me ask you if you would uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you heard some music in Aspen. Uh, and in particular, you heard some music by five Jewish composers. Would you relate that story? Well, uh, this composer, I mean, this conductor, uh, a famous opera conductor, uh, was. Uh, uh, he's also a... a uh, uh, one who want, wants to preserve the music of Holocaust composers. He did a concert in, uh, Sunday in Aspen, um, most important concert of the week, uh, uh, playing the music of all five composers. And I sat there and drew to every one of them, their every line, every beat that I possibly could. And uh, then a couple of years later, my assistant in Kansas City said, you really owe it to those composers to get their work out in the world. And so I chose one, Pavel Haas, and I uh, combined his music with my drawings from his piece and uh, worked with uh, the editor and, and um, made the film collaborating with the past it, in, in memory of those artists who life were not only lost their life, but all their creativity from the Holocaust. That's a remarkable story. And you can see collaborating with the past on Rita's website. And we'll put that website address up later in the chat. Um, Rita, can I ask you about, so I, I know that uh, you're being at, in Aspen uh, many, many summers, maybe every summer inspired so much of your work. Uh, you also uh, told me about a particular time uh, on a ship in Iceland that inspired something. Can you yeah. talk about that, please? Um, we were sailing, sailing into Norway on a cruise and it stopped for the day in Iceland and going into Iceland, there were 17 foot waves and everybody on the ship was sick. My husband was on the bed and I'd given him his peptobismol on the bed. And I had a little dresser and a ream of typing paper. And I stood there and held on to the dresser. And with the typing paper, I collaborated with the movement of the ship. And I ended up with a couple of hundred drawings that I was absolutely thrilled with. And I knew four people uh, on the ship and we had an exhibit on the bed that night. But most importantly, I have used those drawings to refer to ever since that 92 cruise um, to make, I refer to the drawings to make sculpture. And uh, they've been very valuable to me. So yeah, how many people do you know, artists do you know, who would be creating art in the midst of a storm when everybody else is getting sick? <laughs> so Rita, I know also yeah. that, <laughs> did you want to say more about that? I did get sick. <laughs> That's good. Um, all right, so one of the things you've referred to uh, in one of the film clips was dancing with both hands. I know that you're inspired by dancing. That's been a very important part of your work. So there's another very important film, which we're gonna see now, which documents a very unique collaboration of two artists, Rita Blitt and David Parsons of the David Parsons Dance Company. David said, and I quote, Rita Blitt captured motion on paper, unquote and their collaboration resulted in a film caught in paint 
which was invited to over 130 film festivals and won 16 awards. Um, I think you'll see why. But before we uh, do that, I, I'd like to ask Rita, can you tell us how you met David Parsons? And then we'll show the video. Um, David and I argue about how old he was. Uh, I was saying 12, he was saying 14, and we have settled on 13. Um, he was on the stage with a little dance company. And my husband and I went, I guess, because our daughter had studied at the same little company. And um, I spotted David on the stage immediately, and I could not take my eyes off him. He moved so beautifully. His posture was so incredible such grace. Um, I said to Erwin, someday he could be a great star. And Erwin says, and has said, as I recall that story, what did she know? <laughs> but anyway, what did I know? Um, but we ran backstage afterwards to meet David and his mother and uh, to tell them that I thought someday he could be a great star. And he came over the next day and shared my art. And all through these years, David and I have remained very close and shared the pains and joys of creating. That's and David today is a very, very successful world-known choreographer. I'm very proud of him. That's <laughs> wonderful. And you spotted him quick, very early. So let's show uh, the entire film, which is about six minutes. And I think you'll agree that Caught in Paint is a remarkable film. So next film. When I am drawing and painting the music, I am dancing and I'm having a wonderful time <laughs> dancing. I was preparing for my coming exhibit of paintings and sculpture. David was visiting and he coincidentally had his Lois Greenfield photographs on the table right next to my paintings. And we looked at them and it was just so obvious the energy was the same. David said, why don't we do something new? Why don't you come to New York and we'll do something new? And one, two, three, do it. We had this wonderful idea of my painting on Mylar and then I could remove that painting and do another and another and another and another. And the dancers would dance behind the painting, and Lois would photograph the experience. Maybe keep curvy to match the uh, calligraphy. Just a little lower so that your head is going to be in that swirl. Okay. The dancers started to respond behind my painting. David and Lois started telling them what to do. And I think everybody was feeling their way because they hadn't arrived where they ultimately were, that all the shots would be only when the dancers had their legs totally up in the air, off the ground, and within my painting. Three, do it. Two more and you're done. Back arm, click the heels. Relax, the wind's taking you. Shoulders relaxed. One, two, three, do it. David started as a gymnast before he got into modern dance. His work is very energetic and honest. There is this incredible vitality and flowing line. I identify with his work very much. Let's do it. Stay away. Stay alive. Nice one. That's nice. I feel very close to David and to the company. I really did not meet Lois 
until this collaboration. I'd like to work on the ambiguity of the... It was quite a shock to find out that we had so much in common. I want to build up slowly. Yes. Okay. Three, no. Yeah. Okay. Oh, one, two. I think we both love to work spontaneously, and we both love to experiment. I put myself in front of the surface on which I'm going to paint, and I very often close my eyes, and when I am ready, I attack. Go ahead, Rita. David shaped and refined the movements of the dancers. And then Lois centered them, and that's when the photograph evolved with the dancers partially hidden behind the center. Oh, here it is. You have something open. Yeah, uh, oh, woo! This is great. Oh. Mozart. Oh, oh my God. Brava, brava. That's so religious. Rita, come on in here. This is great. It's very religious. Look at that. And the light's fabulous. That is oh. cool. Yes, and what I came up with a good idea. Coffee? I got How do you get coffee? Look at this. Look how the hair and the... Uh, and I love oh, the way sorry. they're burning out. How do I go back to that? To which one? <laughs> Rita, that was such an exhilarating film. Do you want to say anything about it, about your experience doing it? No, it's just brought a lot of joy to, <laughs> I was going to say to us, but particularly my husband enjoyed it so much. Every time I got a, another notice that I was in another film festival, he was so excited. I think it was his favorite film. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Uh, one of the things, we have a little bit of time, I just wanted to ask you a question about one of the films that I saw on your website, I can't remember the name of it, but it, it had to do with uh, you teaching some dancers working. Huh. Can you talk about that? Well, this was uh, Visual Rhythms. It's on my website. It's the name of the film, Visual Rhythms. And uh, it was at the University of Florida. Um, and uh, I was working with uh, uh, dancers, but this could happen with uh, anybody to mimic what, what happened in that film. And for people who want to experiment letting their hands dance on paper, I'd love for them to watch that film. Um, it was a workshop that I have given many times to inspire people. Uh, I, I had the dancer. In this case, um, I went further into the dance part, but I believe in it. Anybody can do it. I encourage the uh, dancers. I put on music and I encourage the dancers to move as they felt, improvise and dance. And when they uh, were ready, go to the table where I had drawing paper and markers and extend your, pa your dance onto paper. Um, and then uh, when you 
put your box on paper and you felt like getting up and dancing more, get up and dance and then go back and forth and then mark the paper. You know, the whole idea really of creating on my mind is enjoying. And certainly working to music, I think is a very wonderful way to enjoy. That that particular uh, film was also wonderful. And I'm sorry, um, we didn't include it in this program. Um, let me say, I wanted to ask you another question. Um, well, let's let's talk now about the present. Um, let's talk about aging. Aging. Uh, how it has affected your work and your <laughs> life. <laughs> well, I must say I feel wonderful. And uh, it's very funny when I became 90. I, up until that time, people always thought I was younger. And I was very very pleased and wanted people to think I was younger. Once I hit 80, at 90, I felt it such an accomplishment that I brag about it. I know the years <laughs> old. <laughs> and, you know, I feel like uh, turning 90 wow. has given me just great hope for the future. Instead of worrying about, oh, can I live that long? And am I going to make it to 90? No one ever had in my family. Uh, I'm 90 and I'm going to keep going. <laughs> That's wonderful. You describe a, a routine that you have. Oh, yes, yes. And this is a very beautiful, important part of my life. Um, I used to get up and, and uh, as soon as everyone would leave for work, I would go to the studio and create. Um, but now I realize that it, the most important thing for me to do first is tend to my body and get moving. So um, in a barn in Vermont, at New Thoughts, Vermont, William Freeman, who is a, a very special movement person, um, has sessions of uh, moving with William. And so every morning, uh, I, I go in uh, the first thing in the morning at nine o'clock to his session, which is uh, later in Vermont, of course. Um, and and uh, William turns on music and he and his partner who is a pastor and, and his cousin, who's a wonderful woman in Oregon and whoever else shows up at the time uh, we move. Uh, we move to the music and William uh, gives us guidance to include every part of our body. And uh, uh, I almost feel like I am creating my art because this is the way I danced on paper and this is the way I'm dancing every morning. But a lot of, a lot of the time we're massaging our body He's, he's has instructed us and shared with us how to go from one part of the body to another. And it's quite beautiful and quite wonderful and feels very good. <laughs> and it's given me a lot of knowledge about my body and makes me feel more limber and ready to move. So I'm grateful for this opportunity. That's great. I think we, I was going to ask you the question about, you know, when you turned 90, um, I guess it was last year, you said your outlook on life changed. Can you share a little bit more about that? I think it did. I, think it did. I yeah. was worried about dying and now I'm worried about living. You told me you realize you have so much you want to do still. <laughs> And I'm just amazed by what you talk about, what you're doing. So let's talk about what you were thinking about or doing creatively these days. Well, this morning I uh, did a painting five feet wide and 30 inches high. I did share with you that I doubt that I'm going to be making seven, seven feet tall paintings anymore. But after I said that, I thought, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Maybe I will, <laughs> not seven feet, but I really think, you know, given the right time and space and how 
hanging the painting and the canvas and so forth. I could still make, but of course I can't stand as long as I used to. And that, that was one reason why I said that I didn't think I'd ever make really tall paintings anymore. But this five foot wide, I'm all set up for it and I love doing it. It's great. You had said before about uh, people are still asking for sculpture designs. So you're, are you still doing that? I am. I For a long time, I had told people, no, I'm not going to make any more sculpture because the man I worked with had died. And uh, I wasn't always in Kansas City where my fabricator is. But I have learned that I can trust the man in charge of that place. Uh, he understands, he, he was there all along when I was creating art, and he understands me and my work, and uh, very happy to follow my instructions. So uh, there's a body of uh, uh, drawings from 1992 that uh, uh, the uh, president of the Kansas City, Kansas College has chosen uh, five of those works uh to be fabricated uh, the reason i mentioned the the works from 92 is that there are a body of drawings that i really really wanted to have made into a sculpture and i never had and this was a wonderful opportunity for me and i've been supervising them uh through email and zoom etc you told me an interesting story recently about about you needed to supervise because not, I mean, obviously you had designed it, but uh, it was important how it was set on a pedestal or, you know, how, how it was actually displayed. And that is every bit as important as, uh, as the sculpture itself. Right. Um, let's talk about, you know, one of the things that, the, the main thing that the Exploring Creativity Group in Ashby Village is, uh, doing our mission really is to inspire our members and members of the community uh, to explore their own creativity so what can you say what suggestions do you have to our members who are interested in exploring their own form of creativity right first of all i want to tell them and believe me that everybody can create and um not to worry so much about the product, it's the process that's important. Enjoy it. And another very important point is, don't expect your art to look like anybody else's. In fact, you don't want it to look like anybody else's. There's no right and wrong in art. So when you create, when you draw, uh, you don't need to make it look like a photograph or anybody else's painting. You put down lines as you see them, as you feel them. Then I can encourage people to uh, try uh, the idea of turning on the music and putting uh, 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 paper down and tape it down so you can work with two hands and let your hands dance to the music. And you can go from one page to another to the other and um, just be very quick, quick. And, uh, you know, uh, a secret is I found out that with two hands, uh, you can't think. <laughs> you, you have to move and create. So that's why two hands sometimes is easier than one. <laughs> but when you're one, you'll start worrying. Oh my God, how do you do that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, just encourage our listeners, our viewers, uh, to uh, write any questions or comments in the chat box. I see that there are quite a few already. Uh, but we are next going to be uh, taking questions and comments from the chat box. So now's the time to enter. If you haven't already, enter your comments or questions. Uh, anything I think is fair game for Rita. Um, one of the things that I found out about Rita, and, you know, as we were preparing for this particular event, is I realized that the way 
Rita works is very spontaneously. And so, so we talked about what, how are we going to create this program and make sure that we stayed within the time and we wanted to show many parts of these films and Rita had so many stories to, uh, to tell. And, uh, you know, in the end, we all, we all agreed that whatever happens, happens, that I'm going to ask some questions and I'm going to respond to what Rita is saying. And uh, uh, Rita, do you want to say anything about that? The process of preparing for this or about spontaneity in general? It was driving me crazy to, to feel that I had to stick to, you know, what we had talked about or anything or timing. Oh my gosh, I have to be me and just let it come out. And thank you, Pat. Thank you. And you are a wonderful host. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm looking at uh, some of these questions right now. Um, Nancy Rubin, we all know is a fabulous photographer. She said, can you say more about drawing and painting with two hands? Mm. Well, I guess what I could say about it, Nancy, is that after a, a couple of years of uh, uh, working with two hands at once, I realized that I felt like it was making me a more centered human being. And uh, as this painting behind me, uh, So I thought that was quite beautiful that, that working with two hands could have that effect on you. And then also then at several occasions, I, I even thought of it this morning when I was working. Um, I think of if I'm working with two hands at once and feeling centered, I can affect the viewer that way. And I, I think that's quite a wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Rita. Jen Carazza asks, many thanks to both Rita and Pat. Wondered, Rita, uh, if Rita can talk a bit more about how new technologies have affected her work. Oh, yes. It's ruined it. <laughs> no. <laughs> what happened was that it, in 2000, when, um, let's see, when the uh, book was created, about my, uh, it, it, the first book was um, an opening in at Brandeis University. And after that book, um, the uh, uh, designer of the book uh, wanted me to go have a, you know, have a website, see most logical next step. And so I agreed to that. And then I was not in Kansas City uh, all the time to work with her. So I start, had to learn the computer to be able to communicate and correct when they're doing the website. So that ruined my habit of creating like, the first thing in the morning uh, before any phone calls, any reading, anything, just letting letting my true feelings, my inner feelings come out on the paper without worrying about the world or people or anything. Um, so then with the advent of my getting on the computer, I have stayed on the computer. I answer emails, I work on projects, and I spend half my life on the computer. I, I don't think it's been good for my posture. I don't think it's been good for my creativity. But on the other hand, that computer is wonderful and miraculous and the things that it's enabled me to do and the communication about the films and everything else I do and have done. So it's, it's that's the effect. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to read some comments. Uh, Warren Lehrer says, Beautiful. Um, Thank you, Warren. Let's see. Uh, Shana says, Rita, such gorgeous, thrilling, joyful, and hopeful work. And Carolyn Steinberg says, Bravo, Rita. Uh, Jan asks, uh, Rita, are there any places in the Bay Area 
where we can see your art and especially the sculptures now or upcoming. I may have missed it, it again. Uh, Thanks, yeah. So there is one sculpture in uh, San Francisco at the Senior Living uh, Jewish Center. Uh, I don't really know their address, but it's a very beautiful new building. And um, they have my inspiration sculpture out in front, a bronze inspiration. And then I have another one in um, Napa, Hillsburg, I think. <laughs> but otherwise, I haven't done that much in uh, California area. This area, yeah. That's about it. There have been uh, private people who have my sculpture. Somebody says, oh, Steve Polsky says, hi, Rita. It's great to see you and share in this wonderful program today. I'm sitting here in my home in El Cerrito looking at the beautiful painting you gave me for my bar mitzvah in 1974. You asked if I wanted money or one of your paintings. I'm so glad I chose the painting, which I still enjoy and admire to this day. Thank you again for this special gift. Steve Polsky. Isn't that thrilling? I saw his name come up in the chat in the beginning of the chat. Oh. And I don't know if we have time, if I should tell this story, but it flashed through my mind that uh, way back, way back, 70s, I don't know, 50s maybe, I don't know. Uh, no, he wasn't, he's not that old. Uh, anyway, I, in his kitchen, his mother had me make a mural um uh, to the poem um uh, trees oh uh, cakes are made by fools like me but only god could make a tree and so i painted that on his wall with the tree and uh i just remember the story how little stevie couldn't believe i was painting on the wall he couldn't understand if i could do it why couldn't he do it <laughs> when I saw his name, it tickled me. <laughs> uh, Beth Rosales says, uh, asks you, what is your discipline to make your work? That's a big question. Uh, listening to my heart, mm -hmm. following my what I love, and, and trying to always to listen for the answers within me. Great. Trying to be true to myself what I honestly really feel, mm -hmm. not easy. <laughs> yeah. Sally Curry says, Curry says, Rita, love this presentation. I am a poet about to turn 90 and am still wondering where my stuff comes from. <laughs> I love it, I love it. <laughs> um, let's see, Liz says, Rita, this has been so lovely to learn about your life's work. I really appreciate seeing a bit of the history of your passion in movement and art. And of course, I love hearing about your commitment to your morning movement practice. Uh, wow, there's so much. We've got clapping hands. Um, Sally says, do you have any input on where inspiration does come from? Uh, sure. The unknowable, <laughs> the magic around us that we can't understand, that we have to accept and appreciate and love. I, you know, it's finally after years and years and years of searching and yearning to find the answers, I made peace with the fact that I really, I, I could never really know. So just accept the existence of this power around me and say thank you it's beautiful uh let's see george kanaki says dear mrs blit i've enjoyed being able to watch today's event it's been a true pleasure to see you again i always admired your artwork and was always honored to have the opportunity to frame them wishing you the best always george kanakis thank you george <laughs> He's given me a problem in life. <laughs> I could never get him to call me Rita. Oh, you're Mrs. Blit. <laughs> Mrs. Blit. And I, so I told him last I talked to him, I'm finally old enough to be called Mrs. Blit. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And here's a message. Hi, Rita. Dr. Greg Mosier here. And love to hear you mention the one-of-a-kind sculptures we will be graced with in the coming months. Our student and employees love your paintings and can't wait to see the sculptures. Thanks for doing the session today and keep up the beautiful work. Um, wow. Anne Hyde. Anne Hyde says, Rita, thrilled to see you, your films and work, and feel the tremendous energy and hope, all caps, you give me and everyone. You shine your light on creativity, goodness, and love. Thank you. I want to learn about Ashby Village. Mom died at age 100, and now I feel freer and ready for a new era. Oh, Stacy Russo says, this has been so beautiful and inspiring. Thank you, Rita. Matt says, yes. love you, Rita. Yes. Stacy has written a book, uh, included me in it about, I think it's about women over 70, I think. And so I'm very anxious for that book to be published any day now, soon. Wow. <laughs> I threaten us at the publishers. Matt says, you probably know who Matt is. Love you, Rita. Always so inspiring. Donna Terazawa says, Rita, the energy and the undaunted spirit. Some of your art reminds me of Sumie, Asian calligraphy. Uh, Beth Rosales says, absolutely gorgeous. And thank you for your generosity of giving your work for free to nonprofits in the Bay Area. Um, Miles says, bravo, you are an inspiration. Uh, Jan Riker said, there are so many comments here. So touched and thrilled with this time with you. The sculpture is at the San Francisco campus for Jewish living. The campus and residents are so thrilled with all your work you have shared. So there we have that. That's San Francisco campus for Jewish living. Peter Sussman. Of her, of Jan Riker. Yeah. Uh, Peter Sussman says, Rita, your talk reminded me of an article published decades ago, and I wonder if you read it. The artist tried to catch the rhythms of nature by affixing markers to tree branches and holding paper next to them as they moved in the wind. It had a big impact me and on me and reminded me of how you try to capture movement. How beautiful. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see. Um, William Freeman. Let's see. And Peter Miller. The, the nice. movement buddies. Oh, yes. Okay. When I see you move, Rita, I see you painting not just with two hands, but with your whole self. <laughs> True. True. Anastasia says, Dear Rita, your work and your family have had such a significant influence on my life. Mm -hmm. uh, Jan says, In your transition to, um, I think it's computers, are you actually drawing on the screens and transferring it to paper or 3D, or is that still whole body work? No, no, it's, it's not for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I am movement. <laughs> I can't be confined to a little tiny screen, but I do recommend the screen if for people to research and find out how to do it, primarily because uh, it, it's so available and you don't have to keep spending money on, on uh, paper and buying more paper. Mm -hmm. And I want people to be feel, feel free to draw one after another. It just wasn't for me. I guess I still won't do it. Oh, here's something interesting. Uh, Jan Carrazza says, my daughter was a dancer and a photographer, worked for Lois Green as an intern in the early 2000s. What a wonderful, uh, um, Camp, the early 20s, uh, 2000s, my ballerina and photographer daughter was an intern. What an inspiring group to work with. Right. Yeah. Um, let's see. Joyce Miller says, thank you for being you, my creative mentor, now that I have turned 80. <laughs> All right. Um, Warren says, Rita, your spirit humor, fluidity, sense of wonder, joy for life, and people is apparent in your body of work. You are an inspiration. <laughs> My goodness. Um, there, yeah. Um, any other, let's see, I, I, I think we're running out of time now, but I, there, is there, there is another one other question that I wanted to ask you. Let's see. 
I, I'm sure I saw the name Stacy Ramos. Yes. And if I did, I just have to say her father, Chris, is was the architect who got me going and said, can you make a drawing, an eight to 26 foot sculpture out of that little drawing? And oh. Stacy and all your sisters. Oh my God. Wow. And That's wonderful. Your father was incredible. Okay, let me see. I'm looking for, there was one that I passed up because it's a perfect introduction to our last film. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Okay. I think it's a question about what how, did I do under the pandemic? That's yeah, what yeah. What uh, how what did the quarantine you? affect your creative process? The pandemic, yeah. Um, uh, it, it, uh, it gave me an. I mean, you know, broke my heart for for everybody's suffering, and thank God I have not physically suffered uh, yet. Uh, but it gave, I, I, I stayed at home as I love to do and created. And I worked on a couple of films and, and books and writing and painting and sculpture and so forth. And I did this film. This film uh, that you want to play is, uh, you want to go ahead and say what you're going to do. Yeah. Be uh, before I do, and this really, I think, fits into this, um, William Freeman and Peter Miller says, with your current concern for the situation in Ukraine, do you see the possibility that you will consider more painting with a theme of peace? Rita? I'm thinking about that <laughs> because this morning when I painted and I looked at my wild lines full of, I don't know what, energy, and then in contrast, I had a painting from 1976 standing there that was so peaceful, so quiet, so exact, so wonderful. Maybe one of the best things I've done. <laughs> wow. uh, and, and so, you know, can I, can I replicate even the piece in this one? Can I once again calm down? feel less pain in paint simple piece. Uh, that's, that's a lovely goal. I've wondered if I should paint, uh, continue painting with some works that I did last year full of joy. Do I have a right to express such joy today? Or do I have an obligation to expect, express joy? Wow. Well, and do it. Yeah. Um. Jay Kranzberg says, Rita, this has been so awe-inspiring. Please give my love to Chela. And Doriana too, she's so grateful for Donna. Let's see, this keeps, <laughs> these are coming fast and furiously. Uh, for uh, bringing up, for Donna bringing up calligraphy, that's what I always felt with your work. And so grateful to see the whole body of your work at one time. Uh, and then, oops, Hannah Kay. There's nothing there. Okay. Um, Jan says it would be great if there could be follow up in the next um, newsletter pointing folks to both the interview, the film on YouTube, and Northern California resources to see your several sculptures in the area. So that's something we've got to think about. So I think the time has come. I wanted to end with. <clears throat> um, actually, we're going to show the film and then we have some closing remarks. Since we have just a bit of time, Rita wanted to show her latest film called The Sun Still Shines, uh, which she created to give hope and lift spirits in the midst of a pandemic and wildflowers, wildfires, as well as other very troublesome nas national and I dare say now international events. This particular film led to Rita being named Visual Artist of the Year by the Raleigh Film Festival. So can we show now the next video?
You, you mute. You muted. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I, I just, a few more messages have come up in the chat box. Uh, Arlene Reef says, can you share the links to all of Rita's films so that we can see them again and again and share with others? And yes, we, um, I'm going to give you the website address in just a few minutes. And uh, Sean Ball says, Rita, you are such an inspiration. I am learning so much more about you today. Thanks for sharing and creating. So that's, that's wonderful. So the time has come. We have to bid goodbye to everybody. I want to thank Rita Blit, who devoted so many hours introducing me to her work in the arc of her career and sharing so much with uh, our audience today. I also want to thank Chela Blit, Rita's daughter, who provided Rita with technical assistance. And I must say, bakes a mean apple crisp as well. <laughs> Thanks to you, our audience, and we hope Rita has inspired all of you to explore your own creativity in whatever form it may take. I want to thank also Avi Rose, our fabulous interim executive director, for his support today. Uh, a few members of our staff, Sharice uh, Henshaw, who's uh, Ashby Village's manager of communications and development, for her incredible publicity support for today's event. Jessica Sterling, our volunteer services coordinator for her patient technical support throughout this process and during today's event. One of our volunteers on the technology team of Ashby Village is Hillary Naylor. Thank you, Hillary. You helped edit our film clips. Appreciate that. And I also want to thank my colleagues and on the Exploring Creativity group who cheered Rita and me on during our preparation for this event. And finally, if you would like to see more of Rita's remarkable portfolio of her work, her sculptures, her paintings, um, as well as her films, see her website address in the chat box. Hopefully it's called ritablit.com, R-I-T-A-B-L-I-T-T.com. And so with that, I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you for this honor of having me. Wonderful.